Before today's video starts, we're just going to have a quick word from our sponsor, Amino. Amino is this cool app that has a network of communities for every interest on Earth. If you like true crime, comic books, sports, creepypasta, then Amino has a community for you. If you have unusual interests like serial killers or unsolved mysteries, it's sometimes hard to connect with like-minded people, and that's why Amino is so great. I personally love the mystery and crime Amino. I find great content on it every day that really helps me with my research for the channel because there are so many postings about crimes I've never heard of. It's also a great way to connect with other people who are fascinated by the same weird stuff as me. Amino also has great chat rooms, interesting polls, and fun quizzes. The bottom line is Amino is a fun place where you can connect with people who like the same strange things as you and there's a ton of fun stuff to do. When you download Amino, I want you to post on my profile what you think is the creepiest crime or unsolved mystery ever, and hopefully I'll be able to use some of those stories in upcoming videos. So download Amino today, then you can find me under the username, Criminally Listed. Number 3, Kathy Wood and Gwen Graham In 1985, Kathy Wood was 23, and in July that year, she was hired on as a nurse at the Alpine Manor Nursing Home in Walker, Michigan, which is a Grand Rapids suburb. Not long after being hired, she was promoted to shift supervisor. Being employed was one of the few bright spots in her life at the time. She had gotten married as a teenager, but after seven years, the marriage came to an end. Without her husband, Kathy was friendless. She started to eat more, and she gained a lot of weight. At one point, she weighed 450 pounds. In 1986, the year after Kathy was hired, the nursing home hired Gwen Graham. Graham was born in 1963 in California, but she grew up in Texas. Kathy was Graham's immediate supervisor. The two became friends, and by the end of the year, they were involved in an intense sexual relationship. One of Graham's favorite things to do during sex was tie Kathy up and then strangle her to the point where she started to convulse. Kathy never said if she enjoyed the strangling, but she never stopped Graham from doing it. At work, both Kathy and Graham were well liked by both patients and staff. Both had glowing, written reviews. One thing that the staff members noted was that Kathy and Graham had a strange sense of humor. Notably, they would joke that they had killed patients. Also, in the home that Graham and Kathy shared, there was a shelf that contained weird items like a brooch, dentures, and an anklet. Graham told people they were souvenirs from their victims. In April 1987, Kathy's shift was changed and she was no longer working with Graham, and the couple started to drift apart. Graham started seeing another woman, and then she eventually moved to Tyler, Texas, where she got another nursing job at a hospital. In October 1988, a year and a half after Graham and Kathy broke up, Kathy's ex-husband, Ron Wood, walked into the police station in Grand Rapids. He told them that 14 months earlier, Kathy had confessed something truly horrifying to him. Kathy told him that she and her former girlfriend, Gwen Graham, had killed several patients in the first three months of 1987. At first, the police were unsure what to think of Ron Wood's story. They got the records from the nursing home and there was nothing unusual. About 40 people died during those three months and they were all listed as dying from natural causes. Then they decided to go through each individual patient's record, and they came up with five deaths that were suspicious. The problem was that they didn't have any physical evidence connecting the former couple to any of the suspicious deaths. So they interviewed co-workers of Kathy and Graham, and the co-workers relayed odd stories about the couple joking about killing patients and keeping souvenirs. The records from the nursing home and the statements from their co-workers were enough evidence to get a warrant and Kathy and Graham were arrested in December 1988. Kathy confessed and turned state witness. She said that in December 1987, Graham first suggested killing someone. She wrote it off as a joke at first, 
but then she realized Graham was serious. Kathy said she was the lookout, and Graham would suffocate the elderly victims to death with a washcloth. Their original plan was to kill victims whose initials spelled out the word, murder. It was their way to secretly taunt their superiors at the nursing home and the police. However, they ran into a problem shortly after they started their killing spree. The woman who had the initial U was too healthy and she stopped Graham as she was trying to kill her. The intended victim never reported the incident and Kathy and Graham came up with a new plan. They decided to kill women who were too weak to fight back. Kathy said they tried to kill 10 women, but they only succeeded in killing 5. A few times they both became so sexually aroused after the murder, they went into an empty room and had sex. Things fell apart in April 1987 when Graham asked Kathy to kill someone and she refused. Kathy Wood pleaded guilty to second degree murder and she was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. She may be paroled in 2021. Gwen Graham was sentenced to six life sentences without the chance of parole. Number two, Gerald and Charlene Gallego. September 11th, 1978 was a hot sunny day in Sacramento, California. 17-year-old Rhonda Scheffler and her friend, Kippy Vaught, who was 16, decided to walk to a shopping mall near their homes. When they didn't return home after a few hours, their families became immediately concerned and they went searching for the young women. Their bodies were found two days later in a meadow about 15 miles away from where they were last seen. They had been bound, sexually assaulted, struck several times in the head with a tire iron, and they each had been shot once in the head with a 25 caliber handgun. The police were mystified by the murders, and it wasn't long before the case went cold. Ten months later, over 130 miles away, another pair of teen girls disappeared. On June 24, 1979, 14-year-old Brenda Judd and 13-year-old Sandra Colley went to the Wasso County Fair in Reno, Nevada. When their friends arrived at the fair to meet them, the girls were nowhere to be found. The police labeled them as runaways, and they did not investigate their disappearance. Another 10 months went by, and then Karen Chipman and Stacy Redekin, who were both 17, disappeared from a shopping mall in Sacramento. Their bodies were found over 100 miles away near Lovelock, Nevada, three months after they went missing. They had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death with a hammer or a hammer-like object. A month before their bodies were found, another young woman went missing. On June 9, 1981, the boyfriend of Linda Aguilar, who lived in Port Orford, Oregon, reported her missing. He had not seen or spoken to her in two days. At the time, she was four months pregnant. Just over three weeks later, her body was found buried in a shallow grave. She had been bound, strangled, and her skull had been shattered with a rock. Sand was found in her nose, mouth, and throat, so the medical examiner thinks that she was buried while she was still alive. On July 16, 1980, 34-year-old Virginia Mokel was working as a bartender at a bar in West Sacramento. At the end of the night, she locked up the bar, but the mother of two never made it home. The summer turned to autumn, and no trace of Mokel had been found. Then on October 3, 1980, her remains were found less than 10 miles away from the bar where she worked. Her wrists had been tied behind her back with fishing line. Due to the level of decomposition, the medical examiner couldn't determine the cause of death. A month later, on the morning of November 2nd, 1980, a group of young men and women went to the police in Sacramento with an odd story. The men were members of a university fraternity and they said that the night before, they attended a dinner with their dates at a local restaurant. At the end of the dinner, 22-year-old Craig Miller and his fiancée, 
21-year-old Mary Elizabeth Sowers walked out of the restaurant and a man with a gun approached them. The man forced the couple to get into the back seat of a car and then he got into the front passenger seat. A friend of the couple walked up to the car and leaned over to talk to the woman in the driver's seat through the driver's side window. The woman screamed at the friend, then slapped him and drove off. At first, the friends of the couple thought it was a disturbing prank. When the friends couldn't get in touch with the couple for the rest of the night, they realized that Miller and Sowers really had been kidnapped. One of the members of the fraternity had written down the license plate of the car and he gave it to the police. The police traced the car to its owner, a woman named Charlene Williams. The police went to the address where the car was registered. When they got there, Charlene wasn't at home, but her parents were. They said that Charlene had gone out the night before with her husband, Stephen Robert File, and they had not returned. Not long after the police arrived, Charlene and File returned home. Charlene, who was four months pregnant, allowed the police to search her car. Meanwhile, File went into Charlene's parents' house and out the back door. He was gone before the police could question him. The police showed Craig Miller and Mary Elizabeth Sower's friends Stephen Robert File's driver's license picture. They recognized him as the man with the gun. The police went back to Charlene's parents' house to arrest the couple, but they had vanished. Later that day, Craig Miller's body was found on a gravel road. He had been shot three times in the head. His fiance was nowhere to be found. The police investigated Charlene Williams and Stephen Robert Files' backgrounds, and they discovered that Stephen Robert File was not the man's real name. His real name was Gerald Gallego, and he had a horrifying criminal record. Gerald was born in Sacramento in July 1946. He never met his father, Gerald Gallego Sr., because when he was born, Gerald Sr. was locked up in San Quentin prison. When Gerald Sr. was paroled from San Quentin, he fled to Mississippi. Not long afterward, he was arrested in Ocean Springs, Mississippi for drunkenness and he was taken to jail. Once there, he overpowered the jailer, Ernest Bagos, and took him as a hostage as he escaped. Bagos was found a few days later, dead from multiple gunshots. Gerald Sr. was arrested a few days later. He was convicted of first degree murder and he was sentenced to death. Not long after being convicted, Gerald Sr. and a fellow inmate escaped from death row. Their escape wasn't a peaceful one. Gerald Sr. threw disinfected into the eyes of a guard named Jack Lundrum and then he and the other inmate beat Lundrum. Four days later, Gerald Sr. and his fellow escapee were recaptured and Landrum died. Gerald Sr. was executed via the gas chamber on March 3, 1955 when his son, whom he never met, was nine years old. By that time, Gerald Jr. had already committed his first sex crime. Then, when he was 13, he was sent away to a boys' school for sexually assaulting a six-year-old neighbor. He was paroled two years later, but he wouldn't even be free for a year before he was arrested again. He and his half-brother were arrested for armed robbery. He was paroled again in 1963, and in December of that year, he got married for the first time. His wife was 21, and Gerald was 16. The couple had a daughter named Krista, who was born in April 1964. The couple eventually split up because Gerald beat his wife with his fists and a hammer. Amazingly, despite the accusations of abuse, and the fact that Gerald had a criminal record, he was somehow granted custody of Krista. Gerald dumped his daughter with his mother and didn't see her much. In July 1966, 20-year-old Gerald married for the second time. His second wife was 24 and she worked as a waitress. The marriage didn't even last a month. Just like his first wife, 
His second wife left him because he was horribly abusive. Nearly a year later, he was married again. Because of Gerald's abusive nature, that marriage also lasted a month. His fourth marriage went the same as two and three and lasted a month. In October 1974, Gerald wed for the fifth time. This marriage lasted longer than a month, but Gerald was still incredibly abusive. In August 1977, that wife finally left him. A month later, Gerald, who was 31, met Charlene Williams, who was 21, at a poker club in Sacramento. Charlene's upbringing was vastly different than Gerald's. She was an only child with doting parents. Her father was an executive with a supermarket chain and her mother sold cosmetics. Charlene was very bright and she was enrolled in classes for gifted children and she played the violin. When she was an adult, she took an IQ test and she scored 160. A score of 130 and over is considered gifted. In high school, Charlene's wild side started to emerge as she experimented with drugs, alcohol, and sex. By the time she met Gerald at the age of 21, she had already been married and divorced twice. In December 1977, Gerald asked Charlene to marry him and she accepted. Seven months later, the couple had yet to wed, but Charlene found out that she was pregnant. Gerald was not happy that she was pregnant. As Gerald and Charlene became more intimate, he told her about fantasies that he had. He said that he wanted to kidnap and keep sex slaves that he could use at any time. He specified that they had to be young. Charlene just wrote off what he said as dark fantasies and nothing more than that. She would soon learn that she was wrong. On September 11th, 1978, Gerald decided to make his fantasies a reality. He and Charlene got into their van and drove around looking for potential victims. They stopped at a local mall in Sacramento and Charlene went in alone. She came across Rhonda Scheffler and Kibbe Vaught and asked them if they wanted to smoke some marijuana. The girls agreed and Charlene led them out to the parking lot where the van was parked. When Charlene opened the back door of the van, the girls found Gerald sitting in the back, aiming a gun at them. He forced them to get into the van and had them lie on their stomachs. He bound them with duct tape and then got into the driver's seat while Charlene got into the passenger seat. He then drove them out to the Sierra Mountains. He got Kippy and Rhonda out of the van and told Charlene to go home pick up their Oldsmobile and drive it back and pick him up. As Charlene drove away, Gerald led Hippie and Rhonda out to a wooded area. Charlene did as she was told and returned after dark in the Oldsmobile. When she did, Gerald emerged from the woods with the two girls. Gerald forced the girls to get into the back seat of the car and then he got into the passenger seat. He directed Charlene to drive and after a short distance, and seemingly at random, he told her to stop. He ordered Rhonda and Kippy out of the car and led them to a wooded area. He then beat them with a tire iron and shot them. He walked back to the car and then he looked back at his victims and noticed that one of the girls was still moving. It turned out that the first shot had just grazed her head. He walked back to the girls and he didn't miss with his second shot. Not long after the murders, Gerald forced Charlene to get an abortion. She wanted to keep the baby, but Gerald was totally opposed to that, so Charlene saw no point in arguing. Less than two weeks after he killed Rhonda and Kippy, on September 25th, Gerald found out that he was wanted by the police. Prompted by a friend, Gerald's daughter Krista, who was 14, reported Gerald to the police. She told the police that he had been sexually abusing her since she was six years old. He would abuse her when he went to visit his mother and when she would stay with him for short periods of time. When Gerald heard that Krista went to the police, he and Charlene fled. 
Three days later, they were in Reno, Nevada, and they got married. When he got married, Gerald used the name Stephen Robert File. After the wedding, he continued to use the new name to avoid being arrested because there was a warrant out for him for sexually abusing Krista. On Father's Day, 1979, Gerald and Charlene went to the state fair and Charlene found 14-year-old Brenda Judd and 13-year-old Sandra Colley standing near the entrance to the fair. Charlene offered the girls money if they could help her put flyers under the windshield wipers on cars in the parking lot. The girls agreed to help, thinking it would be easy money that they could spend at the fair. They followed Charlene back to her van, and when they opened the back door, they found Gerald sitting in the back, holding a gun. He forced them to get into the van, where he tied them up, and then he got into the driver's seat, while Charlene got into the passenger seat. They drove to a hardware store, and Gerald went in, leaving Charlene in the van with the two girls. He came back with a shovel and a hammer, and he got into the driver's seat. Gerald drove for a while, and then at some point, he pulled over, and he made Charlene drive. He got into the back of the van, and as Charlene drove, he sexually assaulted the girls. When they got to the desert, Gerald took Brenda and Sandra away from the van, one at a time. He beat them both to death with his recently purchased hammer. After driving back home, Charlene cleaned up the van. Brenda and Sandra's bodies wouldn't be found until 2000, 21 years after they went missing. In September 1979, Gerald and Charlene moved back to Sacramento. On the morning of April 28, 1980, 10 months after kidnapping and murdering their last two victims, Gerald told Charlene that he wanted another girl. A few hours later, they drove to a local mall and Charlene spotted Karen Chipman and Stacy Redekin. Like she did with the first two victims, Charlene asked the 17-year-olds if they wanted to smoke some marijuana. They agreed and they followed her to the van. After getting Karen and Stacy into the van, Gerald sexually assaulted them in the back while Charlene drove. Once they were near Lovelock, Nevada, he got both young women out of the van. He beat them to death with a shovel and a hammer. As they drove back home, Charlene threw the bloody hammer out the window and into the desert. In April 1980, Charlene found out that she was pregnant yet again. Two months later, she and Gerald took a trip to Gold Beach, Oregon. While they were driving around Gold Beach, they saw 21-year-old Linda Aguilar, who was visibly pregnant, walking down the road. They offered her a ride, and she got into the van. Aguilar was sexually assaulted in the back of the van by Gerald, while Charlene drove to an isolated area. When they came to a stop, Gerald led Aguilar away from Charlene, who stayed with the van. When he came back to the van, he bragged about being the pregnant slave with a rock, and then strangling her to make sure that she was dead. But the autopsy later showed that Gerald failed to kill her with the rock or by strangulation, and she was buried alive. On July 16, 1980, Gerald and Charlene, who was pregnant, spent the night drinking at a bar to celebrate Gerald's 34th birthday. The bartender that night was 34-year-old Virginia Mokul. When Gerald and Charlene left the bar, they didn't go home. Instead, they sat in their van and waited for Mokul to finish her shift. After she locked up, Gerald approached her with a gun. He forced her into the back of the van and then he drove to the apartment building where he and Charlene lived. Gerald ordered Charlene to go inside and then he violated Mokul in the van in the parking lot. When Gerald was finished, he made Charlene come out and drive the van. While Charlene drove, Gerald strangled the mother of two to death with his bare hands in the back of the van. On November 1st, 1980, Gerald and Charlene were drinking again and they decided to go cruising for yet another victim. At around 1am on November 2nd, 
They happened upon Craig Miller and his fiance, Mary Elizabeth Sowers. Gerald got out of the car, pointed a gun at the couple, and then forced them to get into the back seat. Charlene drove to a gravel road, and Gerald ordered Craig to get out of the car. Gerald told Craig to start walking, and when Craig turned away from the car, Gerald shot him in the back of the head while his fiancé watched. Gerald shot him twice more in the head to ensure that he was dead. Gerald then had Charlene drive back to their apartment building. Once there, Gerald led Sowers into their apartment where she was sexually assaulted. After a few hours, Gerald got Charlene to drive them out to a pasture. When they got there, Gerald shot Mary Elizabeth Sowers once in the head and three times in the neck. Her body was found three weeks later. In the spring of 1984, Charlene testified against Gerald at his trials in Nevada and California. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to death in both states. However, he was never executed. He died at the age of 56 in a Nevada prison in July 2002. Because Charlene made a deal with the district attorney, she was sentenced to 16 years and 8 months. She was released from prison in 1997. In 2013, she was living in the Bay Area under a different name. When she was interviewed by a local newspaper, she pointed out that she never physically killed anyone. She also said that she was the one who put Gerald on death row, and she was proud of that. Number 1. Marc Deroux and Michel Martin On June 24, 1995, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo, who were both eight, were playing in their neighborhood in Liège, Belgium. When they didn't come home for dinner, their parents became alarmed. They contacted the police, but the police did very little. They assumed that the eight-year-olds had just run away. Their parents desperately searched for them in Europe, North America, and South America, but they couldn't find any traces of the two girls. Just a month after Julie and Melissa vanished, 130 miles away, two young women disappeared. Anne Marshall, 17, and Afia Lambrex, 19, disappeared while on vacation in the town of Ostead, Belgium. Once again, the police did very little about the disappearances. Also, since Anne and Afia were 10 years older and disappeared over 130 miles away from where Julie and Melissa went missing, no one connected the disappearances. On May 28, 1996, about six months after the teenage girls vanished, 12-year-old Sabine Dardin disappeared from the town of Caen, Belgium. She was last seen riding her bike. Just three months later, on August 9, 1996, 14-year-old Letitia Delay vanished after leaving a swimming pool in Bertri, Belgium. The police of Bertri took the disappearance seriously and they started interviewing people who were in the area where Letitia was last seen. Several witnesses saw a strange van and one even wrote down a partial plate. The police were able to trace the van back to 40-year-old Mark Thoreau. Thoreau was well known to the police. In February 1986, he and his then-girlfriend, Michelle Martin, were arrested for sexually assaulting five young girls. In April 1986, Thoreau was sentenced to 13 and a half years in prison, and Martin was sentenced to five years. While in prison, Thoreau and Martin got married. Thoreau appeared to be a model prisoner, and after a few years, they were considering him for early release. As they were considering releasing him early, Thoreau's mother sent a letter to the warden advising him not to release her son. Unfortunately, they didn't heed her advice. Out of the 13 and a half years he was sentenced to, he ended up only serving three years, and then he was released. Shortly after getting out of prison, he met with a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist deemed him to be psychiatrically disabled. Because of this diagnosis, Thoreau received a pension from the government. 
While he was being paid a disability pension by the government, Perot got involved in several criminal activities, including drug smuggling and car theft. Perot made a lot of money from his criminal activities, and he bought seven houses. On December 6, 1995, Perot was arrested for his involvement in a luxury car theft ring. Not long after his arrest, on two separate occasions, the police searched his house in the city of Charleroi. During one of the searches, that was conducted while Duro was in the house, the police thought they heard what sounded like children screaming coming from the basement. They went down into the basement, and it was clear that construction had recently been done there, but they didn't find any evidence that there were any children in the basement. Duro told the officers that they must have heard children playing out on the street. The police believed him, and they stopped looking around the basement. After his house was searched, Thoreau spent three and a half months in prison. While he was in prison, no females who lived near his homes went missing. Then two months after he was released from prison, 12-year-old Sabine Dardien went missing, and this was followed by the disappearance of Leticia Deleuze about two months later. After the van was connected to Thoreau, he and his wife, Michel Martin, were arrested. Two days after they were arrested, Thoreau took the police to his house in Charlevoix. This was the same house that police officers searched and thought that they heard children screaming in the basement. Behind a false wall in the basement was a cell that Thoreau had constructed. The cell was 4.9 feet high, 3 feet wide, and 6.8 feet long. There was no natural light and barely any ventilation. In the cell, they found Sabine Dardien and Leticia Deleuze. Both girls were still alive. They were reunited with their families shortly after they were found. The police searched Duro's houses and they found hundreds of videotapes of Duro sexually abusing women and children. It turned out that he drugged his victims with drugs that he was given as part of his government pension for being psychiatrically disabled. The police continued to interview Duro, and the day after the girls were found alive, he admitted to kidnapping, but not killing, Anne Marshall and Aphia Lambrix in August 1995. The next day, he led the police to three bodies, and they weren't the bodies of Anne and Aphia. Two of the bodies were Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo, who were both eight years old when they vanished in June 1995. They were kidnapped before Duro went to jail for three and a half months for auto theft. After kidnapping them, he imprisoned them in his dungeon that he constructed in the basement of his house in Charleroi. When the police were searching the house and heard the children screaming, it was probably Julie and Melissa that they heard. When Duro went to prison, he left his wife, Michel Martin, in charge of going down to the dungeon every day and feeding the girls. Martin went to the house every day, but she only fed the dogs. She never went down to the dungeon. She said she was too afraid to go into the dungeon. As a result, the eight-year-old starved to death. Hero discovered their bodies after he got out of prison. He stored their bodies in a freezer for a week and then he buried them. The third body that was found buried with Melissa and Julie was 43-year-old Bernard Weinstein, who supposedly was one of DeRoe's accomplices. Weinstein supposedly helped DeRoe steal cars, and he also apparently helped kidnap Julie and Melissa. Weinstein's murder is the only murder that DeRoe confessed to. DeRoe claimed that Weinstein let Anne and Aphia die, so as punishment, he buried him alive. A month after Duro led the police to the bodies of Melissa, Julie, and Weinstein, the bodies of Anne and Aphia were found buried in Weinstein's backyard. It's believed that they were buried alive as well. The crime shocked the nation of Belgium and 300,000 people took to the streets to protest the police's handling of the missing girls. Supposedly, before the police searched his house after his arrest in December 1995 for auto theft, Duro's mother and a police informant told the police that Duro had a secret dungeon in his basement. 
even though two different sources told the police that Duroux, who was a convicted serial sex offender, had a dungeon in his basement, and the police saw that construction had been done in the basement, and they thought they heard children screaming in the basement, they still didn't find Julie and Melissa. Nearly two years after he was arrested, Thoreau escaped from custody. He was luckily arrested a short time later. In 2004, over seven years after they were arrested, Thoreau and Martin, along with another man named Michel Nihul, went to trial. Nihul was accused of being involved in the kidnapping of 14-year-old Leticia Deleuze in August 1996. Phone records show that around the time that Leticia was kidnapped, Thoreau and Nihul spoke to each other many times. Nihul denied being involved in the kidnapping. He said that the calls that were made around the time of the kidnapping involved the sale of illegal drugs and there was no talk about kidnapping or sex slaves. At his trial, Thoreau said that he was just a cog in a bigger criminal network that sexually abused children. He said that members of the network included police officers, high-ranking politicians, and members of Belgium's social elite. Many people believed Rose's claim because of the police's inaction when the girls went missing. People also think it's suspicious that the police couldn't find Melissa and Julie, even though they supposedly knew that Duro had a dungeon and they heard children screaming in the basement. The police and the Belgian government said that they found no evidence that Duroux was part of a criminal network that abused children. Instead, they blamed the handling of the cases on police incompetence. Sabine Darnien, who was kidnapped and found alive in the dungeon, seemed to collaborate this. She said that during her 79-day captivity, the only person she saw was Duroux. Michel Nihul was acquitted of kidnapping but convicted on drug charges. Thoreau and Martin were both found guilty of all charges against them. Martin was sentenced to 30 years in prison for letting the two eight-year-old girls starve to death. In August 2012, much to the anger of the Belgian people, Martin was granted parole. After she was released, she moved into a coven in Neymar, Belgium. In 2015, the nuns who lived at the coven announced that they were moving to Brussels and Martin was not welcome to move with them. A former judge in Nelmer decided to rent out part of his house to Martin because he thought that she deserved a chance at rehabilitation. Thoreau was sentenced to life in prison. In 2013, he applied for parole and he was denied. Thoreau has been held in isolation for years and his lawyer has complained about his living conditions. He says that Duro wants a barber, and since he can only exercise at the gym on weekends, he thinks that Duro should get a bike. Duro's lawyer says that he hopes to have Duro, who is called the Beast from Belgium, released from prison by 2021. Thanks a lot for watching. Hopefully, you found that interesting. If you did, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Don't forget to go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merchandise, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.